Rico, outpost of American democracy. The story of Puerto Rico's recovery is more complicated than you think. On September 20th, Hurricane Maria ravaged my homeland, Puerto Rico. Like the rest of the Puerto Rican diaspora, I was desperate to come home and help. At three months, I finally got home. We found entire towns were still without power, as were a majority of Puerto Ricans. The governor of Puerto Rico, Ricardo Rosselló, estimated the damages of Maria and Irma at $94 billion. So far, the only post-Maria funds Congress has approved for Puerto Rico are $5 billion in the form of a loan. The official death toll was 62, but various investigations placed it at over 1,000 people within the first two months that followed the storm. And nearly 1,000 people remained in shelters. Diego Padilla Castro. Diego Padilla Castro, whose home collapsed, was still waiting for the $500 advance FEMA gives many hurricane victims. Two weeks ago, he was told that he has been approved to move into public housing, but he was still waiting for an address transfer on his official documents. We're in El Ingenio. It's a neighborhood that's between Toa Alta and Toa Baja. This is the place where the most people died immediately during Maria. The town of Toa Baja was caught between river flooding from the La Plata Dam and storm surge from the ocean up north. Within the first two days of the hurricane, the mayor reported eight people had drowned. And according to Governor Procello, over 2,000 were rescued from their homes. San Ciprián. San Ciprián también. Y San Nicola. At 98 years old, Felicita Concepción still remembers Hurricane San Felipe in 1928 and San Ciprián in 1936. Those were some of the deadliest hurricanes in Puerto Rico's history. Felicita says María was worse. No me acuerdo. ¿Qué recuerda de esos huracanes? No me acuerdo. El más fuerte, fuerte que pasó ahora. Daniel Otero, better known as DOC, is a famous Puerto Rican rapper. He's lived his whole life in El Ingenio. When he realized the water continued to rise, he found a neighbor with a boat and rushed to rescue his great-grandmother. Literalmente, el que hayan pasado por encima de los cables de, de electricidad. Estos cables. Sí, no, este, justamente este poste ahí, por ahí fue que nosotros pasamos. Wow. So he's saying that when, when he went out with some other neighbors to rescue his grandmother, the water was just over these electric cables that we're seeing here. In the days that followed the hurricane, water remained stagnant, animal corpses were rotting, and people were hungry. And when the days and weeks passed with no sign of FEMA, he reached out to the only nonprofit he knew, even though Buena Vibra was a foundation for the arts. And we saw all the people crying in the street. I was so impressed. Marta spent the hurricane in a shelter and returned three days later to find her home was completely flooded. <laughs> Her house has holes where mice and rats can get in, leaks that could threaten the roof, and humidity that could accumulate hazardous mold. Buena Vibra will try to buy her kitchen appliances and patch up the roof while she waits to hear back from any federal aid. How much do you think will be needed? to fulfill the needs that FEMA sees in Puerto Rico? There are various numbers out there, but I would suspect we'll be in the 50 billion wow. range. But again, that is just a gross estimate based on as we look at the programs yeah. into the future. And I'm not talking about into the future today or tomorrow. I'm talking about years. We are going to be committed here for a long time. FEMA can say that they'll stick around for long, but one of President Trump's most controversial tweets two weeks after the hurricane said, the U.S. can't keep FEMA and the military in Puerto Rico forever. That's where many nonprofits and community organizing steps in. Puerto Ricans are more aware about how the United States can help Puerto Rico and how they can help Puerto Rico. 
when we are on the on the street working with the people, we have been seeing a new way of Puerto Ricans. They're more willing to to do it by by, by themselves. Adjuntas, like most towns in the central mountain range of Puerto Rico, was particularly devastated by Hurricane Maria. When we arrived, nearly three months later, the entire town was still without power. When Annie returned home after the storm, she found her roof gone. Her son fixed it, but the spring water connected to her house was still unsafe for drinking. And buying bottled water gets expensive. Well, the water is the most difficult, because you always have to get it, or you have to get it to get it to get it to get it. If you don't, I don't know who is going to get it to get it, but at least I don't do it. But even more expensive than water is the lack of power. Do you have any idea how much time you have spent buying gasoline? From Maria, don't worry, because I'm going to scare you. Yes, more than that. Quite, quite. I would say more than 500-600 dollars, really. It's hard, the gas. Casa Pueblo, a globally recognized and award-winning conservation nonprofit in Adjuntas, stepped in after Maria to provide all kinds of basic necessities to locals in theirs and other towns across the island. Nosotros aquí le damos lo que tenemos. No importa partido, religión, clase social. Todo el que viene que necesita algo de lo que tenemos, se lo damos. Sin fijarnos en nada de eso. The town of Adjuntas has just under 20,000 residents, but around the community of El Hoyo, they've heard that if they ever get power restored, it could take a whole year. We were just walking up the hill from Annie's house when we met Jonathan and his mom. Without power, all they do is visit neighbors and family members who live next door. What was the most difficult to be without power? In the night. Yes, in the night. La soledad. Televisión, este, no hay nada para un entretenerse. Jonathan was months away from finishing his master's degree in child psychology, but since Maria, he had to take a leave of absence, and now he's worried it'll set him back. Sí, me preocupa porque este, me, me, me atraso, me perjudica, que me atraso. The road that gets him to school was destroyed. Just up the road, for another neighbor, Maria, the lack of power could be the difference between life and death. Maria is on dialysis, but without power, her machine doesn't work, so her husband has to perform the process manually. Can you, can you describe to me how the dialysis is performed? What, what do you use? How, how, how do you do it? Tiene un, un, un gelo, como un gelojito, se le pone una bolsa ahí, baja por gravedad. So manually, they're just depending on gravity. By force of gravity, to is pull how it's to pull it out. Este se le saca por la grande lo que ellos tienen, por esto. Y ahí baja manualmente a través de esto. ¿Ves? ¿Eh? Así sucesivamente. Wow. And you have to do this four times a day for two hours, every day, even through the night. That means he also has to do it when it's dark. Initially, to see what he was doing, he was using a signal light that he ripped from his truck attached to a car battery. But that failed. Now he's using a solar bulb that Casa Pueblo gave him. But manual dialysis is still dangerous. El manual no saca el agua suficiente del cuerpo, las toxinas del cuerpo. Entonces se me quedan en el cuerpo y eso me está afectando. Ha sido bastante cuesta arriba porque me siento más cansada, más débil. Me puede dar un, un paro real, me puede dar. Pues yo también estoy operada de corazón abierto. Does that scare you? Eso la, la asusta. Sí, y mucho. They didn't know it yet, but both Jonathan's family and Maria's are among a few households in the town that Casa Pueblo will fit with solar lighting, water filtration, and a small refrigeration to tend to their most basic needs. Knowing Puerto Rico is part of the United States, I would have never imagined the damage to the island's power grid to be as serious as it was nearly three months after being hit by Hurricane Maria. It was worse than I imagined. It, it was worse than I could ever conceive. As soon as I saw the first uh, light bulbs that were made from concrete, 
you know that's supposed to withstand so much power and they were they were they exploded they, they weren't most of them weren't even toppled they were just blown up from the from the middle in two sections of it and as soon as i saw that i'm like this is not normal this what happened? Not only was Bracero one of the first people to realize Maria's devastating effects on the island's power grid, he also had a firm understanding on what it would mean for Puerto Rico in the long term. We have approximately 800 transmission towers. We, we lost around 680. Two-thirds? A little of, bit more. Yeah. A little more than two-thirds yeah. of the towers yeah, destroyed. Yeah. yeah. What has that done to, you know, getting power back online for the island? I mean, what... It's been... It's been... It's been brutal. Ramon Luis Nieves is a state senator in Puerto Rico. He wrote the law that created the Energy Commission. Why was it so vulnerable? Why was it so, you know, you, you take one down and the whole island goes away? So Puerto Rico is an island. As an island, it has to import uh, fossil fuels, mostly oil, to operate our energy system. Apart from that, our system is a centralized energy system, which means that all of the system uh, is interconnected. We have to decentralize. We have to integrate more renewable power into our system. We have to integrate the model of microgrids. Most of the people live in the rural areas of Adjuntas and they're not gonna get power at all uh, in months to come. And some communities, the, the Power Authority have stated already that at least 200 communities in Puerto Rico will never get power again, ever. Recovery for Puerto Rico is a steep uphill road because the island's economy was already in shambles. Before Maria, Puerto Rico was suffering a profound financial crisis, unable to pay off a 70 plus billion dollar debt. And to understand the debt, you have to look at what made up Puerto Rico's economy and its relation to the U.S. The heart of the relationship is still colonial. Irán Melendez Juarbe is a professor of constitutional law. What's the um, simplest way that for somebody uh, who's coming new into this conversation about Puerto Rico, would you describe is the relationship between Puerto Rico and the U.S.? We are a non-incorporated territory of the United States. We belong to, but we're not a part of, the United States. And then we are foreign to the United States in a domestic sense. But in an international sense, we are domestic. If it sounds confusing, welcome to the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. The Puerto Ricans now have as much political freedom as any state in the Union, and they're working out their own economic destiny as well. Puerto Ricans are American citizens, yes, but we can't vote in presidential elections unless we move to the states. We have no representation in Congress, although Congress has the ultimate authority over the affairs of the island. For decades, the Puerto Rican economy consisted primarily of these enclaves of American corporations that benefited from tax incentives that were created by Congress, not by Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, impoverished since the days of Columbus, reaches new heights of democratic progress. In the later days of that regime, um, uh, pharmaceutical companies and so on established uh, here. The end result of that is that you develop a sort of like hollow economic model. In the 90s, Congress began phasing out those incentives, but the island's economy had already grown around those corporations. So that you depended so much on these companies doing business here, so that when they finally left, we were left with like a deep, you know, a hole, right? To fill that hole, in the absence of a healthy local economy, Puerto Rico resorted to borrowing. Bonds issued by Puerto Rico are, you know, exempt from taxes. So that makes, made at the time, our bonds extremely attractive for bondholders, right? Because of a federal law from 1917, mm -hmm. right? That allowed for that. We were giving an unlimited credit card, right? The fact that our economy was based, dependent so much on those investments, is sort of crowded out like other initiatives. Not only were the bonds tax exempt, but paying them back was a priority established by Congress over the funding of public services in the island which led to the deterioration of sectors like power, education, and health. The crisis propelled a mass exodus of Puerto Ricans to the U.S., with over 300,000 leaving the island since 2010, and in the months after Maria, almost another quarter million have left. And now, under the GOP tax reform, Puerto Rico is facing yet another massive blow. 
The bill, as negotiated by the House and Senate, will impose a new tax on products produced by some of the remaining manufacturing companies left in the island, which, according to the governor, could threaten hundreds of thousands of jobs up to a third of the island's tax base. So if our economy was uh, with pneumonia before Maria and Irma, we were intubated, and here is the U.S. government through the Congress unplugging the generator. The economic structure of Puerto Rico rests on a highly specialized agricultural system based on external trade relations. Sugarcane is king, the principal source of income. We started growing tobacco many years ago, as my grandmother told me. Somebody gave me a little plant of tobacco, and she recognized it, and she talked to me about her tradition. She grew it. We met Samuel through Tara Rodriguez Besosa and her Solidarity Bus, or Guagua Solidaria. The project, funded by the Puerto Rico Resilience Fund, will take brigades of agroecology experts around the island to rehabilitate and jumpstart about 200 farms in 24 months. And so it's the full circle. We give them seeds, we buy whatever veggies They're they food. have, we cook the veggies, we give the food to the volunteers, wow. and we're trying to like restart yeah. and you got like an economy. While Tara and Vero popped up the community kitchen, volunteers worked hard on the farm rehab. There's something so cathartic, not just you know farming, but just get a feel of how individuals are you know, literally rebuilding from the ground up. I became an agronomist in a time that there were no jobs in agriculture, that you have to make up whatever you wanted to make. In 1940, 59% of all exports were agricultural products. Of this, 90% was sugar. Puerto Rico's agroeconomy has been long lost. Before Maria, Puerto Rico imported 85% of the food it consumed. During the first half of the 20th century, Puerto Rico's farmlands and agricultural workforce were exploited for the production of sugar. Starting in the late 1940s, under Operation Bootstrap, the U.S. incentivized American companies to launch operations in the island, creating an industrial economy and leaving the agroeconomy behind. Jose Caraballo lives in Caño Martín Peña, a settlement still forgotten and extremely poor that was founded by the families of those who came from the countryside looking for work in San Juan. It was a jumping off point for many in the mass migrations of Puerto Ricans to the mainland in the mid-century. A lot of people say the history was that our people left the countryside to come here and look for work. I, I, I look at it the other way. We didn't, the government didn't build schools in the countryside. They didn't build hospitals in the countryside. So our people had to leave, maybe to find work, but I think it was also to find better health and better education for their kids. And it sounds to me uh, uh, more reasonable. They just come to look for work because in the countryside they had work. They, they, were, they were farmers. For many of those farmers, the wisdom wasn't lost. They just had to trade it for opportunity elsewhere. They actually took Puerto Ricans out of Puerto Rico to grow food in New Jersey, in Connecticut. It's not an exodus when, when you, you're taking it. It's an extraction. Else. It's an extraction. The phasing off of tax incentives and policies like the Jones Act, which deprives Puerto Rico from direct commerce with countries other than the U.S., have depressed the economy and made the cost of living very high for Puerto Ricans. The solution for so many, and more so after Maria, is to make use of their American citizenship in the mainland. We're just so concerned about our family that we don't care whatever we have to do to survive. Yeah. Doesn't matter if I need to go in the place they don't want me. In the place they've been telling me I'm not welcome. I go there. For my family, I do whatever it's needed. You know, we leave with that kind of dream that mm -hmm. The kid is going to be Lin Manuel Miranda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Or Sonia Sotomayor. Or Sonia Sotomayor. Yeah. Or J-Lo. Or J-Lo. Y la tierra nunca deja de llamar. <laughs> Never. Many hear that calling and return, like Samuel after he graduated UC Berkeley, and Tara after becoming an architect in New York. And so did Jose's father in the 60s. He came back in 63, and they stayed here. They both died here in Puerto Rico. They came back to, to their country. 
and it's real nice to be here in your country where you were born, where your mother was born, and live where your parents live, where your kids live, where your grandkids have, have lived. It's, it's been an uphill battle, but it's, it's been a good life. It makes me really emotional. Well, because I think about uh, when I have it, it is, you know, it is. So where does Puerto Rico take off from here? For Samuel, he'll keep on farming tobacco in the hopes that his son can get a fair shot in a Puerto Rico with less inequality. Tara's goal is 50% food autonomy for the island in the next 10 years. So once you get into the practice, okay, there's going to be a hurricane again next year. Yeah. We just got to know how we're going to bounce back and how to best prepare and how to grow our food in between and be happy. I think that um, one of the decisions that we've made for many years now is to not wait for government to decide, to not wait for bureaucratic relief, to just do it. As we toured the island, we met many people who are not sitting idly, waiting for the bureaucracy of the federal, state, or municipal institutions. They're instead lifting Puerto Rico with their bare hands and creating with that strength a new paradigm.